morning. We're going to start with Patrick McDonald. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, some procedures that he's put together for working in cold environments in the sawmills and everything. Uh, we've heard from Patrick before on his project for uh, gloves that he did with Superior. Uh, it was well done. It was excellent. And I'm happy to have Patrick uh, do another presentation. So we'll we'll give it to you, Patrick. And uh, I guess you got a document also to share, Tammy. Um. Yeah, I can get going here. Can you see the presentation? Yep, go ahead. All right. So today I'll be reviewing uh, what winter preparation means I can for Canadian sawmills, and I'll be sharing some of the best practices that we have. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing what we do and learning about what other companies are doing in Canada to pre prepare for winter. So, you know, as we as we go through this, and um, there's another presenter today as well. But as we're as we go towards the end of this, it'd be great to if you have any other, you know, anybody else on the call that has some some good ideas to share i'd be i'm really looking forward to hearing those so um again i work at camp i've been there for about 50 uh about eight years altogether but uh 15 years as a safety professional and um i i did write an article for cfi uh called cold stress that just came out i think yesterday and, and bill asked me to share some of the highlights with the group here today um trying to boil it down as uh, you know everybody's safety professionals on this call so we don't need to get into too much detail on the education side of it, more of the what we what we can do and the best practices uh, we can share. However, I wanted to just quickly go over, you know, what hypothermia is and and uh, frostbite. So, according in, to NAOSH, when exposed to cold temperatures, your body starts losing heat faster than it can produce it. So, prolonged exposure to cold will eventually deplete your body's stored energy, resulting in hypothermia or an abnormally low body temperature. So a body temperature that is too low affects the brain, making the victim unable to, to basically think clearly or, or move very well. Um, and then, you know, frostbite is an injury caused by freezing, resulting in loss of feeling and color in the affected areas. Most often affects the nose, ears, cheeks, chin, fingers, and toes. Frostbite, as we know, can be permanently damaged uh, your body. Tissue in severe cases can lead to amputation. Uh, in extremely cold temperatures, the risk of frostbite is increased for workers with reduced blood circulation and those not dressed appropriately. So I will move on here. Uh, cold stress. So let's chat about uh, how the different work groups can combat cold stress in, in sawmills. So what can workers do? Simply enough, dress warm, uh, la layers of clothing to protect against cold, use moisture wicking base layers, Choose insulated waterproof boots, wear provided ice cleats. We'll talk about, a little bit about that uh, as we move forward. Insulated gloves, uh, I'll talk about some that go down to minus 35 degrees Celsius. Incorporate warm-up exercises into the daily routines. Take scheduled breaks in warm areas. Fuel up with warm beverages, high-energy food, and stay informed about weather conditions and uh, early signs of cold stress. What can supervisors do? Uh, supervised can help manage uh, through leadership and proactive measures, leading by example. So demonstrate appropriate dressing for the weather. Consider job rotations for workers to prevent overexposure and allow uh, acclimatization during sudden temperature drops. Monitor weather conditions and adjust work schedules accordingly. Encourage scheduled warm-up breaks uh, for morale and safety. And then provide wind breaks or sheltered areas for workers to take break, uh, breaks and warm up. Uh, Quickly, what can management do? So again, management's role is critical in ensuring a safe working environment during cold conditions. Plan ahead, so assign maintenance to ensure insulated doors, functioning heaters, uh, include cold-related injury procedures and first aid emergency response plans, support workforce training to equip employees with the knowledge to stay safe, conduct a risk assessment, uh, considering all relevant factors, work activities, clothing worn by employees, and then create a cold exposure plan, uh, exposure control plan. So outlining control tra control strategies and responsibilities for management, supervisors, employees, and contractors. Um, I'm going to highlight some winter initiatives that we have uh, at Canfor here. So 
I'll talk a little bit about the PPE controls. So winter glove selection, uh, ice cleats, administrative controls. So winter checklist, communications plan, then engineering controls, pedestrian walkway maintenance and, and snow scraper. And again, probably nothing new to the folks on the call here, more of a reminder as we move into uh, the winter season. So winter gloves, uh, you know, as as Bill alluded to, we we have a, a pretty comprehensive glove program, and part of that is just it's ever you know it's always getting better, right? It it never ends. So we've looked at um, adding, you know, towards the end of last winter, we added a minus thirty five mitt that you can see there that uh, had really good reviews from our employees, uh, especially up up north. And then um, this year, we're actually introducing a minus five degree uh, Celsius waterproof gloves. So some of the feedback I had last year was, uh, you know, maybe some of our workers outside forklift operators that are, are stacking bunks on loads um, or in and out of their forklifts, their leather gloves get wet and then they don't work very good. So these waterproof gloves are really good. I actually have a pair of these in my truck that I use uh, all year round and um, they work really, really good that they're hundred percent waterproof and they do have that, uh, that lining inside for the cold. Uh, mandatory ice cleats, not gonna get into this too much, but basically a standard work procedure we created a few years ago after we had some employees falling down on ice, hitting their heads, obviously not good, very dangerous, and you could be very severe injuries. So we figured we did a soft rollout a few years ago, and now it's basically a requirement. So. Uh, basically, the standard work procedure for mandatory ice cleats is um, all workers are directed to use traction devices when necessary. And the reason I say traction devices is our woodlands folks, you know, using ice cleats doesn't necessarily work for them. So we, we've expanded to say traction devices. I think there's like 20 to 30 different types out there that we allow. Um, it provides guidance on the selection criteria and the use. And, um, and, and then some of our sawmills, we gave every employee a set of ice cleats and we plan to do the same this year. A winter checklist without getting into too much de detail, basically, you know, a requirement that every mill goes through and identifies uh, salt and sand containers that they're full and ready to use. Wall openings are closed off with um, astral glass or uh, insulation. Doorways are closed and properly sealed. Make sure there's a roof over the doors, you know, for falling snow and ice. And then heaters, make sure they're maintained, available, and working condition. Winter safety communications plan. So this includes training, um, the SWP, winter driving. It's just kind of a, a well thought out, you know, I think we're going to do, we're going to start. We started last week. We'll do about six weeks of uh, communication out to the different stakeholders in the company. So, uh, you know, the, the frontline employees through crew talks and our TVs. And then we've got uh, our online, Cam4 online, where our supervisors can access it. And, um, you know, safety alerts that we send out and just kind of having a communications plan, basically marketing the, the winter items that we have. Some of the best practices one of our mills had is uh, they created a winter sand and salt map. So it basically just shows all the areas on site where the boxes are and where they're located. And, you know, we find it's good for auditing. And then obviously when contracts or workers are required to refill the boxes, they know where they are. Uh, pedestrian map. Um, this is, uh, you know, when we have pedestrian routes, it, they have priority for snow removal. Usually those areas are salted and sanded first and offer workers a safe place to walk. Um, obviously, it's keeping them away from uh, mobile equipment as well, right? And ice cleats aren't normally required if, they're, if the route is maintained that they're on, but it's definitely a way that, uh, you know, the, the winter safety complements the pedestrian interface work that we put in in the summer. This one here I want to share uh, is a, kind of the last engineering control, and it's, it's a snow scraper. So it's for a finished products, uh, finished lumber packages. And what we had at Elko, I had actually, one of our mills, we had an individual that was standing on the side of their forklift. This is going back five or six years. Uh, but the individual was on the side of their forklift, shipping forklifts, and they had a, a shovel and they're trying to shovel the, the snow off 
I think it was like two or three, uh, two or three finished loads high, and the individual slipped off the side of their forklift and fell in between the forklift and the package. Uh, you know, had had some damage to the hip and the leg. But we thought, you know, why is this person up there? And and really started looking into shoveling packages and and with the freeze thought you know it's it's tough sometimes to get it at the right time so we actually looked at okay as we do as safety people looking at the engineering controls so how can we build something so people do not have to you know get out of their way to to climb out of their machine to clean the snow off so we came up with this contraption and some of you might already have some a similar system but i figured i'd share it here so it's uh Basically, it allows shipping employees, they don't have to shovel snow off finished packages anymore. It allows for safer loading uh, when they're loading trucks and and transportation, obviously, uh, with the finished products. And I'll, I'll see if we can play this video here. And it just kind of shows how it works. But it's a, it's a scraper, it is movable with a forklift, so it, it's portable. The uh, scraper bar that you'll see that actually takes the snow off is spring-loaded. It's lined with UHMW plastic, so it doesn't damage the lumber wrap. Um, it can handle packages up to 20 foot in length, and it costs about $20,000 each that we did at every location. I'll just try to play it here. You can see it's it's fully engineered. The, the package is just pressed up against it, and then it's pulled back. And then the and then now it's it's safe to load. So when you get when you get a big snowfall, it it really works great, and and saves on our MSI incidents, slips and trips because our people aren't coming out of the forklifts, and um, and it's good for transportation as well. So in conclusion, you know, in the world of uh, wood products manufacturing, where winters can be harsh, teamwork is key to managing cold stress. So workers, supervisors, and management each have critical roles in keeping the workplace warm and safe. So let's continue working together, staying informed, ensuring that safety and warrants go hand in hand. I'm really looking forward to the next presentation and, and the Q&A when we can share some, some other ideas. And that's all I had. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Does, does anybody actually have any questions right now for Patrick? Because uh, I actually have one. And I noticed you had combustible dust on your your plan there. Do you want to just give a, a quick highlight how you treat combustible dust in winter versus the rest of the year? Yeah, I, th I think it's just a it's a big reminder. And and you know when we look at our risk assessments with combustible dust, is you're you're clo you're in closing areas, and we also are adding ignition sources. So any sort of propane. Um, you know, I saw one time we had. We had some uh, contractors in servicing our radiant heaters and they're using a wand to blow off the dust when the mill was operating. So just a good reminder of, to everybody to just, um, you know, we're tightening things, we're enclosing areas that normally enclose. So have a really good look at what you're doing and just remind them about the fundamentals of, of dust. Great, thanks. So it looks like we have a raised hand with uh, Daryl. Hi, Patrick, thank you for your presentation. Quick question, do you have any written guidance on employees leaving the shift early because there's approaching weather, there's foul weather, or uh, how do you handle there's a, a winter storm approaching? This is a little different than maybe the context of what you were speaking to, but I'd be very curious to see if there's any formalized approach to uh, a lot, you know, how we deal with the employee's safety in leaving the work site and returning to the work site for their shifts. You know, great point. Uh, to be honest, I don't know if we have anything written in in our policies on that. Uh, possibly, you know, I would say individuals that are in the in the field working, they have more control over that where they're planning. But uh, you know, unfortunately, for some of our divisions that are that are remote where people are traveling. It's uh, it's tough sometimes, but I I would say it's lenience on on work crews that are that are in in that situation, right? That are traveling. I think uh, another item I guess I would I I've, I've seen that we utilize is uh, they'll have buses where the crews will uh, travel together. So in a situation like that, if the weather's too bad, I guess 
it would probably make a group decision not to travel and wait till the weather clears. But yeah, we, great question. We do clearly put the responsibility on the employee to decide if it's safe for them to be on the highways to get to work. What we offer is some understanding and le leniency if it's legitimately bad weather. Uh, if authorities are recommending stay off the roads, for example, then that becomes a slam dunk. If someone says, I'm not going to be in today because, you know, the roads are too bad, then it, that's a, there's no question. It, it, it's probably only once in many years have we ever gone back and said, come on, like you, you called and said the roads weren't fit to come in today. And, and that's just not the case. Only once, you know, did we ever challenge that back. And that, that works pretty well for us. Yeah, Daryl, that's great. If if you could share that with the group, I think that would be uh, fantastic. Yeah, I, I, honestly, guys, I don't know if we even how much we have written, but I'd be happy to share what we do have. Awesome. Yeah. And I can say that too. It's the same here for uh, up in uh, Cochrane. We're we're in northern Ontario. We're pretty lucky. Most of our employees are within that five kilometer blueprint of the city. But we uh, the same thing. Daryl said if there is weather coming, especially for our employees that are coming in from out of town, if they'll come up and ask the supervisor, saying, "Listen, there's a storm coming in. Do you mind if I leave early to get ahead of it?" Uh, yeah, but for sure, we'll 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 accommodate. And yes, go 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 ahead, no problem. And then like to your point too, if the roads are the point where they're going to close the roads and yes, obviously stay home and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make do with the employees we, we have on site. But as far as um, actual written procedures, I don't think we have much, but we, we, we kind of just do the same thing that Daryl was, uh, Daryl was saying. Thanks guys. Good question, Daryl. Thanks a lot. Any other questions for Patrick? We can also get them at the end. Uh, so Jesse, uh, are you going to be doing the presentation today for? Yes, yes, okay. I will. Um, so I'll just uh, I'll just share my screen. Just let me know when it's up. Can you introduce yourself to the group so oh. everybody knows where you come from? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, so my name is Jesse Kidd. I'm the production superintendent at Green First Forest Products in uh, Cochrane, Ontario. Uh, I've been in this role uh, fairly new, maybe about. Uh, well, going on just over a year and a bit now, but prior to that, I spent six years in the uh, in the health and safety uh, specialist role, and uh, but I've been in the forest industry in one uh, sector or another for the past 25 years. So um, yeah, so that's and of course, uh, recent uh, co-chair of the uh, WSN uh, Forestry Paper Products and uh, Converting um, Advisory Committee as well. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to be doing is, um, is my screen up now? Can you guys see that? Okay, I'm going to leave it in this mode because every time I go to slideshow, I lose it. So I'm just going to leave it here. So just a bit of background on this, on this presentation here. I'm just going to, um, so th this was done back when we were, we were Rainier, but we, we still follow this and we, uh, Everything in here, it's it's the same thing we're doing now, except of course we're green first. I just need to update this uh, this presentation to reflect that. So this is part of our winter preparation standard practice. Um, this is one of many. I'll go through a few additional ones just to pop it up and show. But again, every time I'm on these calls, it's the similarities between like the the sites. It's it's so so you're going to see a lot of stuff that uh, that Patrick reviewed in in his presentation. So th this was put in place because we did have several uh, slip trips and fall incidents uh, regarding different in, um, th throughout our operations. So back when this was done, this was about 2000, I'm going to say 19. Between the sites, now not just Cochrane sites, there was six individual mills. Uh, so during that time, there was about 18. Uh, we had 18 reported injuries from slips, trips and falls uh, during that winter. So we we all got together and um, okay, how do we how are we going to start preventing that or get more um, get more involvement and you know come up with come up with a, a strategy to try to reduce these. So we came up with our winter preparation standard practice. So it, what it includes among others is like roles and responsibilities are clearly defined when it comes to the general manager, uh, superintendents, yard superintendents, um, health and safety specialists, and employees. We talk about winter conditions and storm preparation and re response. Uh, we talk about clearly defined and maintain uh, pathways for the employees to walk and access various areas of the plant. Uh, we, we talk about the requirements for wearing cleats. And of course, you want to have this plan 
reviewed and in place by November uh, 15th. And usually October 15th or early October, actually like now, we start rolling this out to the supervisors for reviews and maintenance as well. So just on roles and responsibilities. So the general manager, he authorizes the implementation of this plan. He ensures risk assessments are conducted and he gives instructions to ensure that the elements of the standards are followed. For the supervisors, they're responsible to train their employees on this plan to enforce. So enforce the use of walkways and the use of cleats. And then of course, monitor the effectiveness of uh, the slip prevention measures. All employees, they're prior to uh, their reply to uh, participate in training. So I do have a cold stress training plan. And again, similar to Patrick, it talks about hypothermia, like different cold stress, uh, frostbite, that kind of thing. Uh, proper PPE for especially our employees that work out in the yard. Um, uh, it, also, the employees uh, talks about the walkways and the use of cleats. So again, follow the proper use of the walkways and the cleats. And then, of course, the employees are, are to notify us if they see any unsafe conditions, especially, say, walking from the parking lot or driving into the site. They can let us know that uh, ice conditions are building up. We let the yard supervisor know and we can go and spread some sand down or ice melt, um, in, uh, especially in the walkways. The EHS specialist, so he owns the, and he owns the implementation and the coordination of this, uh, of this, um, of this. He provides updates to leadership on status of compliance and uh, verifies compliance with the program uh, requirements. So make sure we have the uh, supplies and maintain uh, the walkways, training, all that's done. So for winter preparation response, so again, we'll do a roof inspection. We do have a, um, we do have a, uh, a checklist for the vehicles. So several of our fleet vehicles, we make sure we have, you know, are the are the wiper blades uh, ready to go? Uh, winter tires, um, you know, all, all all that stuff. Of course, there's more to it, but th we do have a checklist for that. Want to make sure we have sand and ice melting material on site, uh, generators, heating systems. So we'll get our um, our contractors in to make sure that the ducts are are cleaned out and all the um, you know the burners have been inspected and they're ready to go. Uh, snow removal vehicles, blowers, again, all those are, are inspected as well. And again, company vehicles that travel inside and outside of the facility are all have all been gone through the, that uh, that checklist. Um, for designated pathways and walkways, so we have a map of the uh, mandatory pathways. Ice melt materials uh, applied when a winter storm fo is forecasted. So we do have a, a, there's something in our procedure for that when weather is on the way. We'll get people in early to make sure the area is uh, cleared, sanded, and all that. And of course, again, more about the cleats and then inspection of any no known uh, hazardous areas. Uh, these are the cleats we use. Uh, this is one, this is our main one. These are the heel cleats, again, similar. They come in different sizes, low, medium, and high, depending on the boot type you have. Uh, but I also have other ones. We have some, of course, that cover the whole sole. We have some that just go on the heel. I prefer wearing the heel along with this one. It just, I feel if I'm gonna slip, it's gonna be on my heel. So this is the main one, but other options are available if if uh, if needed. Um, again, when it comes to training and education, so we train our employees on our standard operating procedures, the use of mandatory cleats, cold stress, the inspection checklist, and roles and responsibilities. This is just a quick uh, example of our winter preparation checklist. And in here, I won't go through it all, but it talks about, um, you know, all, all that stuff, basically what, what I said about, you know, what's the status? Is it is it completed? Who's going to complete it? Uh, who's going to get it completed? So all, all that's um, all that's covered. Um, so, again, for the summary part, we want to make sure everything's in place by November 15th. It, this requires a review by the site leaders. Again, written plans completed by November 15th and then training. Everyone's educated on the written plan, cold stress, uh, signs and symptoms, care and prevention. Everything's in place by November 15th. We've been lucky so far this year. We're, we're breaking records here in Northern Ontario. It was uh, 31 degrees with the humidity yesterday, so that was a record. Uh, this next slide here, though, uh, this was put in by um, one of our um, advisory committee members who works out of Coburg in Southern Ontario. He just wanted to talk about uh, Trailer creep due to ice. 
So this is on loading docks. Uh, he wanted, um, so I'll just go through it quick. So sometimes on loading docks, it, it's wheel chucks that sometimes slip. So actually the, the, the trailer can actually creep when the loader, uh, when the forklift is going in and out of, of the back of the trailer. So I'll just hit the bullet point. So Stu, uh, the fellow's name is Stu, he couldn't be on today. He had another commitment. But legislation to utilize chucks and any other devices. So dock locks, uh, sorry, dock lock, other devices frozen during ice uh, storms. So double chalking on ice uh, is what they do. And they just got to be aware of that trailer creep forward and the chuck and the, and the wheel chucks, uh, sometimes they don't hold on ice. So he just wanted to mention that don't forget to include loading docks on snow and ice management program. Again, another point that um, not considered a public road. So contractors need to need to use salt, sand and um, uh, and just make sure th those areas are clear. And then this is just a quick one on some of the resources that we um, that we use to pr uh, to uh, prepare this. Um, that presentation. I'll just go quickly on our cold stress. I already had it open. I'll just bring this over here. So this is just a quick thing that we um, that we have for our cold stress uh, our cold stress training for the employees. It talks about wind chill and how it doesn't really have to be below zero for you to be affected by wind chill. Of course, I won't go through everything, but again, we talk about hypothermia. You know, and the, the signs and symptoms, the treatment. We, we talk about frostbite and again, um, you know, recognize the early, early signs of frostbite. So all this is reviewed also with the employees. We talk about trench foot or immersion foot. Um, it's not pleasant to get either. So that's one. And then we also have our winter preparation plan. So our actual policy on it. And again, there's a lot of similarities between the presentation and this, but this just complements it. Again, it talks about responsibilities, the procedure for the um, yard fiber and kiln superintendent, maintenance superintendent, again, ensure damaged doors, walls, everything gets fixed. Uh, exterior lights are functioning, proper maintenance on the heaters, both the sawmill and planer, sawmill supervisor, um, environmental health and safety specialist. But, um, and then what supplies we need, are they all there? The vehicle checklist, maintaining the buildings, so here's a map of our designated walkways. This is the sawmill building here in the planer and everything in red. So these are always kept clear and sanded. If the employees, if the employees are walking on these designated pathways, the use of cleats is not mandatory. Anytime you are out of the, of the designated walkways, then it would be mandatory. And there's areas that we keep where well, there's a lot of high traffic, we keep the whole area sanded. You can see in front of our sawmill main entrance, uh, maintenance shops, that kind of thing. We also, uh, and here's the vehicle uh, winter checklist that we review. And then again, like Patrick, uh, all our snow and ice, uh, the sandbox locations. So again, it's just a, all these uh, stars here are where you can find those, uh, where the locations are. So the yard super, uh, supervisor is at, um, uh, he he's, he's, has a responsibility of making sure these things are filled and um, accessible and has uh, the, the proper, you know, shovels or, or scoops that we use to uh, spread sand around. So those are some of the things uh, that the, um, that our site does. I can't speak for the rest of the sites. So we do have sawmills in most of Northern Ontario, Shaplow, Hearst, Capus Gasing. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what, that's a big part of what we do to get ready for uh, winter here at our site in Northern Ontario. Uh, I hope that went well. Is there any questions? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jesse. I, 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 one thing I've noticed that that both uh, you and Patrick have have clearly defined the responsibilities for the various different levels of management, uh, which is which is great, and also both of you make sure you're starting your program before yes. the snow falls yes which i think is is an important thing and then uh, one question i do have for you is what are they looking for when they do the roof inspections well we're just making sure one there's no uh, obvious like say holes or or dents in in the tin uh everything's everything's closed we have uh, exhaust fans uh, are those you know that the, the everything's working well there 
As far as the snow load, though, we're, we're more worried about the snow load in the winter time. So we'll go up there and actually measure it and then take it off uh, if if needed. Icicles building up along the uh, roof line is another major concern for us. So we do spend a lot. We actually have a uh, we open a, up a job uh, from basically November till March, and it's he, his job is snow and ice removal. That's all he does from I believe it's uh, five o'clock in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon. So I'll just show you a quick. Um, I just wanted to show you one quick thing I forgot to mention. So what we did for for that role, I'll just share my screen. What one quick set, guys? So for what we do for that role, we actually just so there's no. So these are all the areas where. So you these are before pictures, obviously. But these are all the areas where we need to ensure that we have sand and snow removal. So we do spend a good time. You can see this. So this is why we implemented this. All stairways and access ways have to be kept clear of snow and ice. So this is one of the reasons. Uh, in the past, we were pretty good with the main walkways, but all those secondary access points, that's where we seem to lack. So with this uh, fellow dedicated to snow removal, this is much improved now uh, from uh, years previous. I just wanted to take a quick minute and, and share that. Great. I think the use of pictures also helps. Oh, so who yeah. else has uh, questions for Jesse? Okay, Ed, go ahead. Uh, Jesse, how do you keep your sand? The, you you have sandboxes throughout there. How do you keep the sand from freezing in the wintertime? It, it, it's a mix. It's a mix of sand and uh, like salt mix or salt oh. melt, uh, ice melt. Yeah, it's it's a mix. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, because they will. Yeah, they will uh, chunk, uh, stick together, clump up for sure. But yeah, we we've used the uh, we call it pickled sand. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Jesse or Patrick? Yeah, I'm curious if there's any other best practices out there we haven't discussed yet. Yeah, I'd love to open the floor to have uh, anybody talk about if they're doing something different. Uh, Grant from St. Clair Group, I was just going to throw out a question. It's just around icicles. We all hear about that, that we have a lot of a lot of heat and not overly well insulated buildings. So, I mean, behind, besides the standard one of make sure all entry and exit points are covered, uh, that you have that. But has there been any success stories on dealing with icicles? I know we struggle with, with it at our mill. Again, just like you say, poor insulation. Um, we did, we were trying to get the roof redone at our planer to try to help that situation. But we do, everywhere the employees are going to go in, we, we have big canopies to make sure that if any ice falls, it's going to hit that and go off the side. So it it is, um, I don't know about a success story, but it, it's 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 difficult to to stay on top of that ice buildup. It's a challenge. And I've, I've seen in my, uh, you know, my walk through the mills, some some will put heat trace in certain areas, but that causes other issues too. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a it's an ongoing battle <laughs> for sure. But we did we did have success with that the implementation of that seasonal employee. So of course when he when he goes out, we'll rope off the area, but. It's uh, that that's what we rely on. Just remove it as it's building up and don't let it get to a point where these things can come down and injure somebody. So, Patrick, I think I, I remember where I, I think it was the Elko Mill. Did you also designate where your snow removal person dumps the snow? Didn't you have that on your map as well? Yeah, I mean, Elko is a pretty big location so they can put the snow in different areas and i know what you probably saw was where we had the uh, in the finished yard where we had the snow scraper after you put like i don't know 40 50 packages through that you get some pretty big piles of snow so they're they would move that to different locations and then um they would also move where they're loading the the trucks as well there so Okay, and a question for both of you is, do you 
do you do periodic inspection inspections of your walkways and crossing points to make sure there's no uh, blind spots being generated with the snow pile? Like the stuff they're pushing up. I would I would say yes for us, but we again we do rely. The employees are very quick to let us know about any deficiencies that they see. So, but between the the supervisors' daily rounds and just um, concerns from employees, I, I think we we do a good job here of staying on top of those uh, issues as, as they come up. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. It's it's uh, going to be changing day to day, so we would have to lean our on our employees and. Everybody's in on it to keep everybody safe. So, I, I did. I did want to mention one thing, Patrick. Uh, your your snow scraper that you guys use. We actually built one uh, last year. It's very similar to yours, except the guys they would uh, with the forklift. They drop the bundle on it and then they just push it through. And then when they pull it back, the the flap will, is on a hinge and it will come back and let the. Uh, so that was the first year we actually got it going, but it was towards the end of April when we finally worked out all the bugs. So I'm excited to see how it works this year. But we we had, you can imagine, we, we had issues with uh, snow load on those bundles as well. Not only the finished product, but it was the wood coming into the planer, like off the dryers. It will sit in the yard for quite some time. I mean, th these things are stacked up four high and the top rows, uh, they, they get loaded with a good um, you know, a good dumping of snow. And as they come into the planer uh, to start the feeding process, all that snow will end up on the conveyor belts and it goes into a, a bucket. But we almost have to empty that bucket <laughs> like constantly just because of the snow load. So it's a strain on the employees because this thing has to be pulled out by hand. So every winter we struggle with uh, snow coming into the mill. And that's one of the things we implemented last year with that scraper. So I'm anxious to see how it works this year. Yeah, that's great. So you use it for your, not only your finished loads, you use it for uh, that's right. your loads going in. That's, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I know we, I could quickly share an incident that happened in Grand Prairie, Alberta, probably 10 years ago or more. Uh, there was, and it's the importance of having truck drivers stay in their, in their trucks. So they were, it was at a reload. So the, the yeah. wood had already left our area, went to the reload, and and they were they were loading a truck at the reload, and there was ice on the top of one of the packages, and when the employee put the package down, it slipped and slid over top and landed on the employee that was on the other side and killed him. Oh goodness! So it's another just a something I didn't put in there, but it's. Uh, you know, when when you're dealing with ice and snow and and packages are so slippery on that on that paper that yeah, it'll just go right off the other side and yeah, we, importance of keeping them in there in their trucks when you're loading or unloading. Yeah, so we have probably several incidents a year where um, like just the the loader carrying the finished packet package to the just the lay down area, and especially if we got two on top, like you say that 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 paper wrap. Uh, it gets really, especially when it's frozen, it, it, it's like a crazy carpet and the guys really have to um, have to watch and uh, be careful. But uh, yes, we, we've had incidences like that. Fortunately, we do recommend that the uh, we do have the uh, truck drivers stay in their cab or their I think it's a 30 foot radius away from them because some of them like to kind of manage how their truck is loaded. But we, we keep them well out of the area um, and that that's year round. But we we've had incidents where they've slid off the truck bed as well. Great. Also, I guess you have to worry about the the crossing points for your employees on the walkways if there's forklifts in the area with slippery loads and stuff like that. We're, we're pretty lucky that the planer and the sawmill. There's not much. Uh, they're they're two separate buildings, and there's not much like the employees. If they're at the planer, they're staying at the planer. It's mostly our yard, uh, the, the people who are dedicated for the kilns and say shipping, the shipping yard. But we're only talking two individuals. And uh, yeah, so they're constant radio visual communication with the loaders. We have a pretty good, uh, you know, pedestrian mobile traffic plan. And it's, um, it's so we're, we're pretty good there. We're, we're lucky in that sense. There's just not a lot of traffic. Okay. Any other uh, Participants want to talk about some of the procedures that they have that are different. Go ahead. Otherwise, uh, we might uh, just finish this off 
a little bit early. So I want to thank uh, Patrick and Jesse. I think it's uh, a, a great presentation from both of you. It's uh, something that uh, helps bring it front of mind for everybody and things that uh, everybody can sort of consider when they're putting together their plans for the winter and getting ready. Uh, you know, there's no time like the present to be able to start working on that stuff when this before the snow uh, falls. I think one of the the things that I see sites doing at this time of year when I'm out in them is there seems to be a massive cleanup going on to pick up all the extra dunnage and everything throughout the yard before the snow falls on it. Yeah. Helps to reduce those tripping or or bumps in the, the pathways for the mobile equipment. So yeah. Sure. Oh, looks like Marla's got something. Hi, Bill. I just want to share an incident that we had here last week. So we have a Colby crane that um, the crane lifts like 13 ton log bundle out of the lake. And so our procedure, of course, is to not have anybody on the deck when we're loading. And so what happened is the Colby crane picked up the bundle of logs and came over the logging truck to put the whole bundle in the bunk. And when he was lowering it, the brakes didn't engage. So he was lowering it in high. And then as it got close to the bunk of the truck, he turned it down. It didn't go down. So a spring actually broke inside the braking mechanism. And our Colby crane is 1954. So it doesn't have any secondary braking mechanisms on it. So the bundle continued to lower on its own. It didn't fall, it just stayed in that high gear it lowered into the bunk the gravity of course didn't stop it so the the whole truck ended up tilting over until the grapple landed on the deck so it tipped the truck to about a 40 degree angle so um and then it stopped against the bridge rail and everything was safe nobody was there was no potential for anybody to be hurt because of course nobody's in that area when we unload and it lowered slowly as the truck tipped. So um, the age of that piece of equipment doesn't require secondary braking mechanisms. And so when the brake failed, there was no chance for another system to pick up that brake. So I just wanted to share that with the group. Thanks, Mom. Uh, we appreciate that. And I'll do up a thing for you to send out, Bill. Okay, great. It's always nice to get those uh, safety alerts out there. Okay, uh, anybody else have anything? If not, we'll uh, we'll finish for today. And I appreciate Jesse and Patrick doing their presentations. And uh, I'll look forward to the article in CFI Magazine, Patrick, and and read it in there as well. And just for maybe uh, anybody that's on the call, if you do have a safety topic uh, that you think is uh, worthwhile to communicate through the CFI magazine, they do look for uh, people to to submit articles. Um, and it, I think the magazine goes across Canada for the forest industry. So always consider that if you have something that's uh, worthwhile to share with the rest of the industry in Canada. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody, and I hope you all have a good weekend. It's a long weekend for everybody, so enjoy yourself. Oh, Ed right. Kent's got something before we go. Nope, sorry, that was an accident, Bill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we always like to hear from you, Ed, so whenever.